Dear Lord, thank you for this glorious day, our first flakes of snow whitening our ground. It just shows your purity. And we ask that you be with us today as we study your word. And as we study, let us learn to be witnesses to reflect Christ's light and to point others to Christ the light. We ask this in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank Amen. you so much, Jackie. And, uh, oh, hello, people of God. It's Pastor Stephen with uh, a new group today for our weekly virtual Bible study. We're looking in the first chapter of John. I'll share the verses in just a few minutes. And this is the gospel reading for the third Sunday of Advent in this lectionary year. And we already heard a lot from Isaiah last Sunday with the comfort, comfort my people, and a lot of things uh, that we hear every year about prepare the way for the Lord, which Isaiah spoke, but then it became kind of like the rallying cry of John the Baptist. And to, this week we get to look at John the Baptist a little differently and a little uh, from a different angle. John, the gospel writer, He's not John the Baptist because he was beheaded. Sorry, a spoiler if you didn't already know that. But um, John is the most different of the four gospel writers. And sometimes he's symbolized by an eagle because they feel like the others are sort of like land animals. But John just has a whole different perspective. And um, sometimes he goes into long quotes of Jesus as he's teaching things. And I love the first chapter of John. It's the one that begins with, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he speaks kind of philosophically instead of just saying, well, there was a girl named Mary and she was betrothed. Instead of starting like that, like in the beginning, and you have this kind of interesting approach. And still, in chapter one, he does talk about John. And so our verses today pick up those parts after that prologue of in the beginning, which sounds like it's going back to Genesis. So since Judy logged in first, she gets to be our first reader. And we're going to start with verses six to eight, if you would read those, please. Okay. You know, when I read this before, I thought, we should include nine too. It just seemed to go along with it. Go for it, go ahead. Okay, I'll go for it, okay. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. Thank you. Thank you. Any first impressions or thoughts about that passage? Are you talking to me? Anybody. Well, I was wondering how John knew that he was supposed to do that. Was he visited by an angel or what happened that he, I mean, stepping back a little bit further, how did he know he was supposed to? to be the messenger to say that Jesus was coming? Well, we have from the, the other gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we have the, the story of Jesus's baptism, which in the lectionary comes in January. So we, we do a really quick run through the early years of Jesus's life because not a lot of detail is given. Um, and we know that John was kind of freaked out when he's telling people to repent, and then Jesus says, okay, baptize me. And John says, no, you should be baptizing me. And, and But Jesus says this will fulfill some things, so John goes along with it. So um, that doesn't mean he didn't know. Actually, he does seem to know who Jesus is. Does anyone remember the story of uh, when Elizabeth visits Mary that wants to sum that up? Go ahead, Colleen, explain it. Um, I'm pretty sure almost as soon as Mary arrived that little baby John was in the womb and he left with joy. So, um, yeah, so they, they visit each other. And the so it's an unborn child that recognizes the Messiah before anyone else. So somehow John the Baptist, I, 
well, you can only say that the, the spirit is resting on him and he has a special insight. Mm -hmm. And so probably as he's growing up, maybe that was more kind of Elizabeth just saying the baby recognizes, but there was something the baby recognized. Maybe Elizabeth, as she's bringing up her child, as she's saying, you know, you have a very special cousin or relative, and he's grown up knowing that, but he's also feeling the call of God. We're not given a lot of detail about how that is, exactly when he knows or how much he knows, but he understands it's his job to do that. There's, um, there were a group of people that would go out into the hills. They were sort of, uh, sort of like the kind of people that would, uh, on one hand, like they would be naturalists and they would just live off the land. And on the other hand, they were sort of like conspiracy theorists, but they kind of like kept to themselves and they, they felt like society was, was going wrong, but they were to preserve things. And um, one of the places that they lived was in these caves that were near the Dead Sea, where it's not a pleasant place to live, it's wilderness. One of them, one of the areas is called Qumran, starting with the letter Q. Does that ring a bell with anyone, Qumran? Uh, Dead Sea Scrolls? Yes, the Dead Sea Scrolls. So many, many, many years later, they discovered scrolls that this community, I can't remember what they were called, something like Nazarite, but that's not quite it. But they were saving, trying to save scripture and it became, they were discovered, I think, in the 1940s. And at first, the first uh, merchant that found them, well, it started out with a shepherd boy looking for lost sheep, throwing rocks, and he hears a crash. And like, that's not the crash of just stones. He goes up, investigates, finds all these jars. He takes one, and eventually a merchant, oh, yeah, let's try to sell these. And then when the authorities realize this is scripture handwritten from way before even the days of Jesus. They realize they, they have something on their hands. They're old, they're, parts of them are kind of uh, disintegrating, but that's, that has been an important archeological find and a, an important biblical find to know um, when people say, oh, well, it's just copied over and over. We don't know this is authentic. Well, when you can have jars that old that say the same thing that our Bibles say now, that's a, a good sign that that uh, that what we have is accurate. There's a, there's a whole lot more to that. But in that community, they were sort of like the doomsdayer people. And John seems to fit in with them, whether he grew up there or whether he joined them later. Um, he's the kind of person that um, as you think about people that want to live in the wilderness and talk about the end is near and doomsday and stuff, it kind of came out of that culture. I've gone on too much about that. Okay. So, but anyway, so we don't know exactly how he knows, but God has given him some insight that he's the one to call people to repentance. Anything more on that? In verses six through nine, I just noticed there's a lot of mentioning of Jesus as the light. Yes, there He's, is. Yeah. Yes. And uh, the Greek word for light is photo or photos, which it, so when we say photography, we're really saying writing with light. And this first chapter is, an, is a good chapter for an early Greek, a student of the Greek language to read. I remember trying to read this, and although it's very philosophical, uh, this, there came this man, and it was in the beginning, and there was light and everything, it seems very philosophical, but it's in child bite-sized words, mostly small words, and that reminds me, before the rest of you came on, uh, Judy noticed the, the books that are behind my sister Colleen uh, from one of her favorite children's authors and so both of you are teachers or have a history in teaching and think about trying to teach something very complex and deep to children with a limited vocabulary in a way John's your guy he the way he writes this gospel not John the Baptist but John the writer he writes in very simple words which because they're so simple they almost seem kind of really deep and philosophical this little connection there. 
Okay, so John set the stage that he's writing about this, uh, the one sent from God. His name is John. He's a witness to the light, but he's not the light, but he's going to tell about the light. We're going to skip now to verse 19, because it goes on for quite a bit about light, and word, and flesh. All simple words again. Word is logos, which you've heard before, and flesh is sarxe, where we get um, no, carne. No, it's, uh, never mind. Anyway, so we're going to go to 19. Colleen, would you read from there? Um, 19 through what? Um, tell, I tell you to stop. <laughs> <laughs> now this was John's testimony when the Jews of Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Christ. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the desert, make straight the way for the Lord. Now some Pharisees who had been okay, sent- stop. Okay, thank you. As Okay, and mine says, as the prophet Isaiah said, which means that the word order, your translation is doing something different from my English translation with the word order, but they're saying the same thing. Um, in fact, what translation are you using, Colleen? NIV. NIV? Oh, that's right. I'm using the ESV. Okay, the <laughs> English Standard Version. I was like, I'm in the NIV. No, I'm not. Um, <laughs> so here's a translation um, decision. Um, we were sent from the priests and Levites to ask him, who are you? So my translation uses the words, who are you? And your translation said, so they came to ask him who he was. Probably the original words were, who are you? But that's a little bit awkward to say. It's not terrible, but your translation, oh, well, they came to see who he was or to ask him who he was. Um, I just love pointing out little tiny differences in the, in the translations that we're looking at. So somebody summarize for us. How about you, Linda? What's going on? What, <laughs> what do we have so far going on in your own words? Well, that's right. You're the only one that put yourself on mute. You're on mute. I forgot to turn the music off. That's that's right. All right. Yeah. Um, well, uh, <laughs> Can somebody else answer? Okay. Jackie will. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, um, who is it? The, they're, they're just wanting to know who this man is. Why are, you know, why are you here and what are you talking about? And they come up with a few options and he's like, nope. <laughs> well, how about this? Nope. How about this? Nope. He doesn't say it quite like that, but I, I love that they have, They've been thinking about it and they have a few theories. So they're trying to try them out on him and nope. <laughs> and then, so what does he say? Who is he? I'm not Christ. He says he's not the Christ. Yes. Okay. And he quotes he's somebody saying, that we were starting to get to know. He quotes Isaiah. I am the voice of one calling in the desert. He yeah. So that's the verse, me. part of the verse that we heard just last Mm -hmm. last Sunday. Good. So this, I kind of like it when we have something to build on that we've just heard about. It's not just completely out of nowhere. Voice of one crying. Now it's interesting. Uh, this is even more subtlety about the language. The way Isaiah said it, that it was recorded in Hebrew is in the wilderness, cry out or, or cry out. And here's what you should say in the wilderness. And then when they translated into the Old Testament into Greek before Jesus's day, so a lot of these people in that time would be more familiar with a translation called the Septuagint. Has anyone heard the word Septuagint before? Mm -hmm. I've heard it. I don't remember. Okay. Don't and it's a weird that. word. It's not one you use every day and everything. But it was <laughs> the Sept part comes from the number 70. And the tradition was that they asked 70 scholars to translate the Bible from 
Hebrew into Greek, which people were using more and more. And um, so that's why it got its name. And then there are little differences because even there, there's a difference in the nuance of language. So, in, so the Hebrew seems to say, there's a voice crying, um, make a way in the desert. And the way the Greek translation says it is, there's a voice crying in the desert, make um, straight the paths or make the path straight. So is, is the, the voice coming from the wilderness saying make a straight path or is the voice saying go to the desert and make a straight path? And to me, it can be kind of, maybe it's both, maybe a little bit of each, but John the Baptist is taking the <laughs> emphasis that came from the Septuagint that says, I am the voice in the wilderness, which he really was coming from the Dead Sea area and where they, they did that kind of stuff. Little tiny subtlety. I do not think I will work that into the sermon on Sunday, but it's just a little extra I just, today. I just I saw something in my notes. Please. When, when it started um, back in 19, now this was John's testimony when the Jews of Jerusalem, then it, in my notes it said the Jews, it was a, a term that was generally that John used um, of the Jewish leaders that were hostile to toward Jesus. He used that the word. That's Jesus. true. And it's kind of unfortunate because you get a little bit of this negative feeling about Jews, like the Jews did this, the Jews bothered. And, and definitely in anti-Semitic ages, um, Christians that were prone to not be very open to, to Jewish people have, oh, the Jews did this to Jesus, and they kind of took that on. So it's kind of unfortunate, but you're right. That is the way John and his gospel talks about the Jews. Interesting. Any other notes or any other observations in that? So this delegation comes, okay, who are you? Are you this? Are you that? Are you the other thing? Nope, 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 nope. I'm the one Isaiah talked about. I'm the voice crying in the wilderness to make straight the way of the Lord. And Linda, would you read first, starting at 24? I guess you can read to the end. So sorry, Jack, you don't get to read today. That's all right. <laughs> I prayed. <laughs> you did. Okay. Um, now some Pharisees who had been sent questioned him. Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. Thank you. There are a few things in there, but I, I want to ask you before I start prattling on what, what things jump out or what do you notice or what are you missing? It looks like not too many people were allowed to baptize. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, yeah, by, by deduction, we think, oh, well, why can you baptize if you're not who, you know, yeah. one of these people? Okay. Yeah, well, that's we say here, too, that Jewish ceremonies included ritual washings, but normally only non-Jews were baptized when they were converted to Judaism. Yeah, you don't think of baptism as a Jewish thing. Um, and my understanding is at that time, if you were baptized, it was sort of, it's a new start or something. You were kind of crossing over to something different. And it was not something every Jewish child at some point would be baptized or adult or something. But people that were making the plunge, and I, I'm guessing that those that joined these outcast people around the Dead Sea, I'm guessing they did make baptism kind of part of their ritual initiation ceremony. So maybe John was familiar with it and that was just like his normal way of that. This is what you do to say that you're making a change. And he's very clear in his baptism that it's about repentance. He doesn't say, this will wash your sins away. He says, get baptized as a sign of repentance. That was really clear in his message. Mm -hmm. 
there's something that I'm used to hearing when we talk about John the Baptist that we don't hear, and that has to do with what he's eating and what he's wearing. That's, do you, does that ring a bell with anyone? Yeah. He dresses in <clears throat> fur skins and <clears throat> eats some kind of seeds or berries or something. Like that. Yes. Um, and honey. Honey and, uh, and locusts. Yeah. yeah. And so that's mentioned in Matthew oh, Martin. <laughs> what? I forgot, I forgot it was bugs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a forgettable thing. Although it was a year and a couple months ago that we were talking about this with our confirmation class. And I think Sue Chikloski sent out and ordered some, were they chocolate covered uh, mm -hmm. crickets or something like that? And yeah. a few of us tried them. Not something I, I want to have again. In high school, I ate some of those. <laughs> uh, but so the, the other gospel writers kind of make a point about that. and. John has a different angle. The angle is from all these people asking who he is, and nope, 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 and it gives him a chance to say who he is and what he's doing. And yeah, so how about these people he asks about? First is the Christ, and remember Christ is a Greek word that means anointed, and the Jewish word is Messiah. So they might have said, are you the Messiah? So I think we have a sense of what that means. Are you the Messiah? Nope, I'm not the Messiah. And then they say Elijah. Why would they ask if he's Elijah? Wasn't Elijah taken up? Yes, that's exactly it. So Elijah, they don't have any burial place for him. Apparently he was taken up to heaven. And so there was always this expectation When's he going to come back? Which, in a way, is like a foreshadowing of Jesus ascending, and we do talk about one day he will return in the clouds. So, of all the prophets, and he, in so many ways, looked to be a prophet and acted like a prophet. Ah, is this you, Elijah, coming back? Nope, that's not who I am. So, are you the Messiah? No. Are you Elijah? No. And then, what's the other thing they ask? The prophets. Yeah. And I'm wondering if anyone has a good footnote on that, because that's just the prophet. What is, is there, were they expecting some other prophet, or what does that mean? I'm not seeing a... Mine says a false prophet in my notes. Hmm. I don't think anyone would say, yes, I'm a false prophet. <laughs> no. Mine says um, of the prophet, the Jewish people expected a variety of persons to be associated with the coming of the Messiah. John the Baptist emphatically denies being the prophet. He had come to testify about Jesus, yet they kept asking him about himself. He ans his answers become progressively more terse. More terse. Yeah, I think so. He's like, come on, guys. That's not who I am. I did find I have a little uh, footnote here about verses 20 and 21. Let me read it. John denies being the Christ, Elijah, or the prophet. The Christ. And he says, see a note on 141. I'm not going to do that yet. Elijah, who never died. That's in 2 Kings 2 was expected to return at the end times. We just talked about that. It's mentioned in, he's mentioned in Malachi 4, 5, to restore all things. And then, though the Baptist resembled Isaiah, I'm sorry, Elijah, in his rugged lifestyle, he denied that he himself was Elijah, though Jesus, understanding more about this than John, saw John as fulfilling the prophecy about Elijah. The coming of the prophet was to, predicted by Moses in Deuteronomy 18 and was expected in Jesus's day, as mentioned in John 6. John denied being this prophet as well, though he was a prophet. Okay, I'm, I'm not so familiar with who they thought would be the prophet. I wasn't aware of that. Excuse Does anyone me. feel like looking into Deuteronomy? In, I'm just curious because you said Elijah, right? You didn't mention 
because here it says 700 years earlier, Isaiah had predicted the Messiah who, who would offer his life. So could they mean Isaiah? No, no. So Isaiah talked about the Messiah, and that's in a famous passage uh, in several places, but one of them is Isaiah 53, where, um, which is by his stripes we are healed and by his wounds. I can't quote it very well right now, but does, does that sound a little familiar to you? That I'm on this here. It's in Isaiah 53. That's a have, famous passage about a suffering Messiah. I have Deuteronomy, if you want me to read that verse. Yeah, that was Deuteronomy 18.15. Yes. Yep, it says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own brothers. You must listen to him. All right. There it is. I guess that's pretty clear that Moses <laughs> said that. I will raise up a prophet. And a number of them were, but I can see where a passage like that would make them think, okay, we need to listen for the prophet. Were you still saying something, Linda? Mm, no. Okay. We covered it. All right. Well, as far as being preachable, I don't feel like I'm, I'm going to have to dig a little bit more because it's like, are you this person or that person or the other? Nope, nope, nope. And, uh, Oh, then, uh, then the Pharisees are asking them some more. So why are you baptizing? And he says, I baptize with water. Somebody else is going to baptize. And he's even better than I am. Oh, um, yeah. These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptized. So I don't feel like that's that inspirational as far as something for me to preach, except... Um, I love that John was really clear about it, and he didn't let the paparazzi or the fame get to him, and like, well, maybe I am pretty important, and yes, I bless thee, and you know, he, uh, you know, I'm all about this other person, and you need to get ready for them. And he says that he is, he's so unworthy that he can't even untie the sandals or the thongs. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. He humbles himself. And we know from foot washing that, that that was a role of a servant to take off the shoes and wash someone else's feet. And for him to say, I'm less than a bootlicker or whatever, that um, <clears throat> he really has a, an important, he has a good sense of how important Jesus is. Huh. Yeah, I had, I, uh, go ahead. I had another question. Please. I, I, Maybe I should know this answer, but I don't. Um, where in Christ's teachings is this happening? Is this the beginning of Christ's teachings? Or, I mean, because they're just the way he's saying, talking about Christ. Well, what we see in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, I think it's all of them are fair, either chapter one or two. To, except Matthew that takes a long time with the Christmas story, if I'm, uh, I can't remember for sure, but it's in all of them, John the Baptist shows up pretty early, Jesus is baptized pretty early, and we really don't know about any ministry with Jesus before that. Okay. Maybe That's he right. was still being caring of people, and but this is, it's clearly his baptism is the beginning of his public ministry. So John does arrive on the scene before Jesus, he's talking and getting the word out, and it's creating a buzz. And we do know later that there are people that must have been baptized by John the Baptist, that then they went back to their homeland or back to the hills or wherever, and somehow they missed out on Jesus. And now Jesus has been crucified and resurrected, and people are believing in him, and they're like, so is this the guy John was telling us about? So they, or it sounds like they didn't get the whole story, but Jesus wasn't doing anything public that's ever recorded before this. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Okay. I, and even if you think you know the answer to a question to kind of throw out things, I'm hoping there are people that are listening that are like, oh, I would have asked that or I was wondering. So it's all good. I like the uh, footnote, too, for 127, 
It says, Jesus said that John was the greatest of all prophets. He is such a great person, yet if, if such a great person felt inadequate even to be Christ's slave, how much more should we lay aside our pride to serve Christ? When we truly understand who Christ is, our pride and self-importance melt away. Awesome. That is great. Yes. Yeah. Any other closing remarks? Well, I was just, this is just a geography kind of thing. I was surprised to see that it evidently wasn't the Bethany that we think it was. There were two Bethanies, one on either oh, side really? of Jordan. It says, uh, you know, regarding um, this all happened at Bethany on the yeah. other side of the Jordan. It says, the Bethany mentioned elsewhere in the Gospels was only about two miles from Jerusalem. The site of this other Bethany is not known, except that it is located on the east side of the Jordan. Uh, mm, interesting. And we certainly know in our country about having place names that have the same name as other places, huh? Uh -huh. <laughs> Especially Hamilton, which I lived in one in New York, and Franklin. And my sister and I lived for one year in Franklin, New York, didn't we? Yeah. Okay. Well, it looks like we've mined the depths that we can it right now. Um, we light the pink candle this Sunday, the candle of joy. And uh, does anyone have any joyful thing they want to share? <laughs> it's a harder year to find joy, yes. Okay. Uh, I was just wondering how was that uh, signified by pink? Why was it changed? blue or purple to pink? I don't know. So, oh, okay. <laughs> so if you can research it and find out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So the, we used to have, <laughs> a lot of churches had purple candles for Advent, but purple is also the color for Lent. So um, after a while they went to blue. Do you know if our church had purple pyramids for Advent at some point? Uh, the first pyramids we had for Advent were these blue ones that Barry's class purchased for us. Okay, so the ones memory, we're using now, right? Yeah, they were in memory of uh, George Clauser's son. Ah, and you can see my robe in the background, mm -hmm. and I wear my white one during the season so that I can wear, it's the only robe that doesn't have those panels already made on it, um, so I can wear my blue stole, and it kind of stands out because I only get four Sundays to wear my blue stole so um, so that stole is part of the set and it goes with the pyramids every church I served before this I came with my own stoles and I and I still have my own and which once in a while I wear like my Hawaiian one uh, yeah, but like that it. that one is part of the set that goes with the church and at some mm -hmm. point it will be left behind and somebody else will be wearing it so. mm -hmm. If I don't wear it threadbare, and I, uh, which I probably won't when I only wear it four Sundays a year. So. <laughs> but it's an attractive set. I like it. Um, so then the, yeah, it's a weird tradition. You'd think it'd be blue, 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 pink, and then white, but the pink is supposed to be the third candle. So Judy knows that I am kind of rewriting for COVID in 2020. I'm rewriting some of our Advent candle ceremony. and. Every year when I send out the script to the family on the third Sunday, I'm like, light the third candle, the pink one third, and the fourth one I have to say, don't light it last, it's the third one. And, um, so I try to have very clear instructions so they know exactly what to do. And it's still easy to get something goofed up. Huh? I think we've been doing fine this year, but it's a little tricky. So we do the pink one. I think it's supposed to be, yeah, a little bit odd, a little bit different, not as somber as the others, a little bit more joyful. So, oh, okay. So cool. I'm going to be looking for some more joyful things to kind of work into the service this Sunday. So feel free to text or email or call if you have some ideas. It's also the Sunday we would we would have been going caroling. Now we're trying to do this car caroling. I don't know if it's going to work out. So I just talked to Marianne today 
she she said we've had two people contact her to say they would do it and neither of them have young kids or any teens in their families and nobody has called to say we want to come by our house but we're so we're going to wait till the end of the week and see if anyone else signs up and decide if, if it's worth even doing but it came out of youth ministry committee trying to do something in a safe way our kids can do but we'll see Okay. All right, who wants to give the closing prayer today? Yes, Linda. <laughs> okay, I'll... It's off. You're muted. You're muted again. So I was... <laughs> Am I on now? <laughs> now yes. you're on, which you're... reminds me, you'll see I posted, I sang God Rest You Merry Gentlemen, and I posted that today, just before we got on. And you're muted again. I can see the red on it. So okay. I make a mistake toward the end. I play the wrong chord. Like, oh, like, and you can see Judy, my friend in the background with her fiddle, like, oh, you almost were there. So she said something like that. I'm like, let's try it one more time. We did it perfectly. Later that night after she was gone, I realized I didn't hit record correctly. And I missed <laughs> wow. all of that. And I'm like, oh, we'll do it again. Well, now, because we can't do that indoors without masks, we won't do it. So you get to see a blooper, blooper reel today. <laughs> <laughs> that makes you human. <laughs> it really does. Uh, okay, Linda, now we're ready. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Lord, thank you for our time together by Zoom. I thank you again that we have this technology and Unfortunately, I wish I were better at operating in it, but it does bring us all together to study your word, and that's the most important thing. Um, during this special time of the year, may everybody's hearts be full of your word, your, their, your heart, our hearts and minds full of your word, and may we spread your love throughout 